we each relate relate to those those things like uh, Jesus Christ or the Lord Buddha or or Krishna or Shiva or Mohammed or whoever. We each uh, can uh, have our own kind of uh, particular reaction, interest or lack of interest in these as we as we uh, uh, as we hear about them. We can not too. We're not all going to feel exactly the same way. And so, they, in, in many ways, we, I remember growing up in the United States thinking that there was some kind of normal human being. Because they talked about normality as if everybody knew what that was. There's a normal way to be for a man and a woman. And, and, and you could talk about being normal as if, and you assumed that your mother and father, everybody knew what they were talking about. But you had this fear that somehow you didn't quite fit into that category. <laughs> of course, you didn't want to tell anyone, and you pretended you were as normal like everyone else was pretending. But, <laughs> but uh, it became apparent that nobody really knew what it meant. It was another one of those things, those, those ideas that nobody ever contemplates. They just say, you know what a normal, what, what's normal human behavior? And we say, well, of course, of course I do. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> Knowing very well, you don't know what the heck that means. Or maybe it's just some kind of uh, attitude, uh, assumed attitude that you have is a kind of a mi white middle class American that might not fit into what's normal for a middle class British person. But then you assume that normality is, is something that applies to everyone, whether it's uh, European or Asian, African. But what is it? And what, what is, when we, when we say a normal person, and what is an abnormal person? Though contemplating these things, we, we begin to recognize that the more you, you experience life, the more you realize that, that the world, that the planet Earth, is, is populated with an infinite variety of individual human beings who maybe each one are perfect in their own way. You can contemplate like this. Rather than thinking that amid this five billion uh, point four population of planet Earth, there's, there might be a few significant creatures you might call normal or perfect, but they mo you probably won't come across them in your lifetime. Or you hear about them. This is very common amongst the Western Buddhist world. You hear about somebody who's become enlightened and immediately you rush off to check them out. <laughs> but when you go look at somebody who's supposed to be enlightened, they, they just look like some ordinary person. They don't look like they're enlightened. <laughs> or maybe they do things that you think an enlightened person wouldn't do. And so that you, maybe they... <laughs> They stare at the ceiling, or they smoke cigarettes, or they chew tobacco, or something that that, that you think uh, that you think uh, an enlightened person would never do. So then we we get into all kinds of confusion because we some people claim to be enlightened and they they do very outrageous things. We think that may be the sign of of enlightenment is you're outrageous. You do all the things no one else dares do. You say all the things that no one <laughs> And there's a certain part of us that likes that, the idea of, of being able to kind of thumb your nose at the establishment and the kind of heavy uh, uh, established order of life that, that says this is right and this is how you should be and, we, and something in us wants to kind of uh, rebel against that. Because we can see that there's, 
that sometimes human society settles for, for mediocrity as, as normal. What's normal and what's safe is, is a kind of low-level mediocrity. This is what oftentimes happens in de democratic systems, isn't it? Where we, or socialistic systems and that, where you kind of settle for a drabness of human behavior, controlled, and uh, where nobody is doing anything that's too upsetting or too threatening. Or if they are, they're, they're uh, severely reprimanded or punished or exiled or murdered or exterminated. So what is a perfect human being? And, and then we can create a, an ideal of a perfect human being, which is, uh, you know, we can, we can figure you know, all the best, say, proportions of the human body for the female or the male, or the, the, um, the most beautiful features, uh, and, the, uh, and then the, the ideal of being very intelligent, a certain level of I, IQ, and and having a certain uh, uh, benevolence and compassion, uh, uh, sense of humor, uh, all that we can we can we can put all the superlatives together of what would be the best, and create a kind of ideal uh, of perfection. But I'm not talking about perfection as an ideal, uh, as just the superlatives that we can imagine, but the reality of perfection, because each one of us, say, is uh, is living our lives. What is the reason for it? What is it? What is it that we have to learn from it? So this is what we contemplate, and we can go to teachers and and all that, try to find out what they think we should do. Tell me, you know, what what is the meaning of life and. Why am I here and how should I live my life? Because we, we do, we do like to hear what other people say. Well, people that we think uh, have contemplated this or come to some understanding of the human condition. But yet, it, no matter how wise their suggestions might be and how knowledgeable and how enlightened and perfect they might be in themselves, it doesn't really do us that much good till we learn to develop in our own life, in our, within ourselves, within our own mind. Because we can absorb, we can take into consideration what other people say, what institutions say, what the scriptures say, what the authorities say, what the outrageous members of the society say. But in the long run, we're left with, this is the way it is. We're, 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 this is the way we feel. These, these are the kind of tendencies we find ourselves inclined to. This is what we're attracted to or repelled by. This is, this is how we emotionally feel when somebody says this or somebody doesn't say something. And, but it's something that we, we can contemplate no matter what it is. Because we're in that position of the of awakening to the way it is. So when we talk like words like this, and the way it is, the suchness, as isness, then these these are words that that uh, don't describe anything. They can't. This is the way it is. What 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 does he mean by that? But it's pointing to, it's, it's, it's uh, say, inviting us, it's an invitation, encouragement, to contemplate. What is the way it is right now? Not that it has to be any way, or no, it doesn't matter how anyone else sees the way it is. This is, this is actually how I'm feeling right now. This is, this is the, this is the uh, whether it's physical or, or emotional feeling, but you can you there is that ability to contemplate it to to witness it to meditate upon it <clears throat> uh, 
Now, in the in this human realm, the the experience is one of uh, of say the say the basic experience that we all have is uh, the experience of consciousness that we that was uh, that comes from being born into this form. So consciousness is is uh, it, what is it? I mean, it's a common enough word. And we could give definitions on, you know, from the dictionary on what, how you define it. But as an experience, consciousness is this way. We're all conscious right now. And so, this is, uh, this is, this is, this is the experience of consciousness. I mean, in Pali we call it vijnana. Which means that, that we can, we're here. And there's this, this this experience of of knowing things, of being a subject, and that is being impinged on in some way, that is feeling something, that is thinking something. So consciousness is is, is just this this way. We can see it when a when a baby's born. It, a baby is born. It it's a separate conscious being. Where before it was, its consciousness was was its mother's consciousness. So uh, the, it wasn't separate yet. It was connected. It was experiencing uh, the the uh, the sensitive state through the through uh, through the mother. And then, when when we're born, say then the umbilical cord is severed then we're experiencing consciousness as a uh, in a seemingly separate way we're no longer experiencing it through our mothers but through this form uh, uh, and and so that a, a a a baby say is a fully conscious individual being so this is a contemplation of of consciousness, we see all that life is a, is is consciousness itself. The the uh, animal kingdom is conscious. People say even the plants are conscious. The trees are conscious. You think, what do they? You know, they they don't look so. They aren't conscious like I am. They don't have eyes, but they have a form, don't they? They feel things. They're not just uh, lumps of, of inert uh, plastic that have that somehow just were dumped here on the planet. They have they, they 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 what what is the magic? What is the formula that makes them grow from an oak from an acorn and all that? So we recognize that that we are we're experiencing. Uh, a kind of what for us seems like a mystery or a miracle. Something comes out of nothing into in our, in our own human perspective, and just the the human birth. What is it? A, an egg and a sperm come together. Sixty years later, this is this is, <laughs> and yet we can think. Look at an egg and a sperm. Doesn't look like much of anything. It is like protoplasm. It doesn't have any personality. It, it doesn't have anything other than it's just some kind of matter, really, with with something in it that makes it do these things. But it, but yet, when those two forces unite, and then the, something takes place, and then as the uh, then as the as the 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 child is born, then we be. We're, we're starting our lives, say, as a separate human entity, an individual being. So we contemplate this for a whole life. We have to live like this, as a separate, in a separate form. So this is consciousness, and this, and this conscious experience means that we, uh, wherever we are on this planet, whether we're sitting here at Amravati on the twenty eighth of August, nineteen ninety four. Uh, listening to Ajahn Sumedho, or whether uh, you know we're in 
Thailand or in uh, India or Rwanda or the Amazon jungle or wherever, uh, that we are, this is, this is where we are, this is, and we're experiencing, we're feeling whatever is happening, good or bad, pleasant or painful. Now how we interpret it is another thing, isn't it? Like if we, say, if we have a certain culture, then we tend to see things in a certain way. We see when, we're, when we start uh, becoming, like as a child uh, grows up, then it's influenced by its culture, by the, its parents, its peers, the grandparents, the, the society around it. Kind of informs it, tells it what, what life is about, what is, uh, boys are, girls are, what duties are, what we're supposed to... How, what we're supposed to be. So we acquire all kinds of perceptions about life in ourselves. And so we, we see things from certain positions. It's interesting living in different cultures. For example, in, in Thailand, uh, I remember, uh, it's the idea of sitting, pointing your feet at a Buddha Rupa upsets the Thai people. Because they... That in their culture, you never point your feet at a Buddha Rupa, a Buddha image. So, when any of us who lived in Thailand didn't know that at first, we point our feet at the Buddha Rupa and everybody's looking very disgusted with us. We don't know why. Because that's not a part of our cultural conditioning. My mommy never told me that. <laughs> She didn't even mention Buddha Rupas. <laughs> but yet in, in a Buddhist country that would be like contempt or pointing your feet at somebody is like showing contempt. When you want to show contempt to somebody and kind of, you know, look down on them and treat them contemptuously, you point your feet at them. So, I mean, that's, that's a cultural thing. That's not universal truth, but that's a cultural practice that is picked up. It's probably hardly even mentioned. It's just a part of a whole acculturation. And so, uh, you know, myself and Ajahn Rindamo, I'm sure we, our time in Thailand, we picked it up so that to this day I see somebody sitting with their feet pointing at a Buddha Rupa, I go into this, I have the same reaction. I go like that. Why is that? <laughs> because I was I wasn't acculturated as a as a baby, but I certainly lived a, a decade of my life in Thailand, where where uh, you know one was very much influenced by those kind of those those kind of cultural attitudes. And yet, it's oftentimes these things that are are the causes of uh, wars and and angst of all kinds, isn't it? Just the, just the cultural differences that, that, and, and attitudes that uh, just are not based on universal truth, but just cultural uh, emphasis. So we acquire a way of interpreting life from, uh, from uh, say, our cultural background, ethnic background, and that, that de determines how we interpret, how we see ourselves and how we interpret our experience. Now, say the conventions that, the, the, that we call Buddhism or the Buddha Dhamma, these are, say, for most, for many of us who, who have adopted, who, who've become Buddhists, who, say, we weren't born into Buddhist families, but we, we chose Buddhism, we chose the Buddha Dhamma as a something that we, we wanted to follow. So, so this means that we, we're learning how to, say, use the Buddhist uh, teachings for what? To become Buddhists in terms of just becoming acculturated, kind of adopting Buddhist attitudes, Buddhist costumes, Buddhist practices, Buddhist ceremonies, uh, and become Buddhists through through the external, uh, through through the believing in in the teachings and and reading the scriptures. 
in going along with the ceremonies. That's one one way. That's a becoming. That's what I call becoming a Buddhist. But in the actual Buddhist teachings is not. Didn't he? Didn't Buddha didn't teach Buddhism, but he taught Dharma, or he was pointing to the way things are, which is contemplative practice. And he pointed to the fact that all conditions are impermanent. And the, the, this is this is to contemplate impermanence, not to to grasp the idea. And because you're a Buddhist now, you're going to believe in impermanence. But if impermanence or anicca is is a uh, is a contemplation. In other words, you you concentrate your attention on this. You start looking at things in terms of change rather than in <clears throat> maybe in terms of whether you like it or don't like it or or whether it's uh, right or wrong or or whatever you're not you're not you're not you're kind of changing your getting out of just the maybe the emotional reaction to looking at at the the characteristic you're contemplating this state we're in where we're born we get old we die we're contemplating the uh the the movement of thought and emotion, <laughs> mental states that that where we get high, we get low, we're happy, we're depressed, we're we're interested and we're bored. We're contemplating the, the nature of of just memory and of of sound, of smell, sight. We're contemplating, meaning we're we're noticing, we're considering what the the these experiences that we have all the time. But we're contemplating them, that they're through this the, through this uh, teaching of impermanence. Not to try to prove anything or say that make any uh, moral judgment or value judgment about them, but to just notice and to begin to notice how thing, that that things that arise see. So you're you're contemplating the how one thing conditions another. If something doesn't arise, it doesn't cease, obviously. The arising conditions, say, what is that in, a, in human experience? What is modern life about in so much of the emphasis on just modern materialism, a consumerist society, Modern day Britain. What is what is the emphasis made? What do they advertise? What are the values that that are common to say this present age, say materialist, consumerist, modern, technological age? Is it is it something that is do it, what is it the arising or the cessation of things? When you advertise something. And you want to say if you're going to make a, a cinema film, and you you want to you want to get people interested in it, so that they'll they'll spend their money, they'll go to the the cinema and pay the the entrance fee. And you're not going you, you certainly aren't going to draw crowds to something about uh, cessation or emptiness of silence and then you draw the crowds by promising them excitement a thrill a minute how many people get murdered and how horrible how much blood how much <laughs> how much romance romance is exciting sex is exciting if it's full of sex that excites the mind and so the, notice that that the the modern tendency to try to the, the mass media emphasizing can give us a lot of excitement to to because that the arising experience of life is is that way when you're interested in something what is that because you you can't stay interested in something uh, 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 you you get interested and then the interest wanes. You can become interested again, but to sustain an interest, what is your attention span? How long can you hold your attention on something? And then when it 
when it uh, and and if it if it starts getting boring, then what do you do? Contemplate this. You know what happens when when you're feeling bored or or tired or fed up or despairing, depressed. Now oh, this is a contemplation, isn't it? We're 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 looking at. Um, in in our own life, just what 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 is it that the we all experience these? We all uh, can get excited and become interested, fascinated, inspired, high as a kite. But we all we, we can't sustain it for very long. And so you can see modern. Uh, uh, we don't watch television. I very seldom ever get to see it. But just from from the experience of uh, the, the rare times that I do see this phenomena, uh, it seems like it, uh, you know, the emphasis is on, on trying to entertain, and interest and excite people. So when we become aware of that, there's nothing wrong with that, I'm not saying that, 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 that it shouldn't be that way, but we're noticing that that excitement or the, the arising side of life, the youth. We just had this family camp and children, youth. All these are, are interesting. Children are interesting. They when people bring me their, their babies, babies are, are beautiful, aren't they? They're always so beautiful to look at. So everybody that comes, I say, they show me their baby and say, it's the most beautiful baby in the whole world. <laughs> Some people think I'd be a good politician. <laughs> but this is a reflection. It's not just flattery. Is it? Because at that moment, that's the way it seems. At least as far as I'm concerned. That's the one thing I'm looking at right now, and it seems to be the most beautiful baby in the whole world at that moment. I'm not saying it is the most beautiful baby ever in the whole world. There's no, no baby more beautiful than that. But this is more of a reflection. And, and also, you can see that that's the way the mother feels. <laughs> because that's a natural feeling when there's love and the tension and so, then one feels like that. <clears throat> then as you get on towards my age and older, you people don't say that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> because this is the other side. Uh, So the arising, say, that they were contemplating impermanence, is uh, we we began to say emphasize say, in the Buddha's teaching, emphasize the cessation of things because this is this is not uh, generally noticed. Except by contemplative people, people that, that watch and listen to life and, and learn from it, then we're, we're interested in the other side. We've experienced maybe enough of the romance, adventure and excitement of the arising stages of our lives and mental, emotional experiences that, that are that way. But we also recognize, we get a weariness of it. We feel just to keep trying to be interested in things or or have romantic affairs, or have excitement and, and all that, we become bored with excitement. Or the idea of just having, you know, one wonderful experience after another it loses its attraction. We, we, we become more reflective and wondering what is, you know, this, this, this experience of life now is what? Or, say, in meditation, we have to work through boredom. 
uh, and despair. Because uh, when we meditate, we we have a lot of we have to deal with a lot of, of failure and despair because we can't make ourselves successful at meditation. Even the most uh, kind of marvelously successful worldly people fail at meditation. So we contemplate that. If if you're a success at meditation, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> because that's not the point. Not the point of becoming someone who can do it as a person, but it's being able to learn how to reflect on this and to to be able to look at, say, things like despair, how rather than just wipe it out because you don't like it or get high on some kind of meditative technique. That's not the, what we what we regard as, as right meditation would be our ability to sustain attention on on uh, feelings that uh, are we usually don't bother with or we don't we di- we can dismiss or we tend to distract ourselves immediately from them but in meditation we're we're willing to be with them with uh, boredom with despair with disappointment with confusion And that means that then we can uh, say, contemplate it. It's like this. It feels this way. And strangely enough, when we when we appreciate this, it's a it's a kind of wonderful uh, relief that we we don't have to spend our lives just trying to to be happy and run around seeking uh, exciting experiences and, and happiness in the in the sense world, but. We 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 don't we can we can let go of that that kind of uh, compulsion, and we find a sense of relief and inner peace with just the the conscious being conscious, being aware in the present, pure presence. I read this translation of a of a Mahayana mantra, which is pure presence is transcending. So pure presence, just the ability to be in the present is transcending. Meaning that when we when we recognize that, when we realize that, then then there's a then life is no longer a rat race. We're not running around in the in the cycles of samsara because we we find our joy in just being with this experience of life through this form, the way it is, this being here, and what happens to it, whatever happens to it. And that is a relief. And sometimes they would describe Nibbana, the experience of Nibbana, as a relief. Well, I remember when, when I was younger, I was thought of Nibbana as a kind of high. When you reach Nibbana, you're like floating up in the clouds. It's, you know, you're really in ecstasy, in like a drug trip or something. You know, Nibbana, Nirvana is like, like the best. And then I read somebody's the uh, description of Nibbana is, uh, as as um, feeling a sense of relief. Uh, isn't that uh, not so inspiring? <laughs> but when you contemplate that, contemplate this the relief. Like if you're, if something's really, you know, you feel wearisome. You you've been walking too much, and you're tired and exhausted, and you sit down. That sense of relief. What is that like? You contemplate that feeling. And that's more and more the way you feel when you're meditating, a sense of relief. Not that you're, because you, you, you're kind of letting go of this compulsive need to always be doing something, getting something, trying to control, trying to hold on, trying to get rid of bad things, and, and always this, this tension of strife and struggle, friction, 
And you, you stop doing it. You just, relief. Now that doesn't mean that, that every time you feel relieved you, you've realized Nibbana and you're an Arahant. <laughs> but it is a metaphor, isn't it, for, for that. I mean, it's, a, it's something to contemplate. Because relief may be, even though at the moment it 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 we we appreciate it. Sometimes we don't we don't uh, we don't appreciate it really. That feeling of relief because we we think it's it's just a you know or, ordinary thing and it and it's of no significance. It's just you know, I got tired and I sat down. And I felt of such a sense of relief. It's just me, and so we can dismiss things that we do, that we experience, because we, we see ourselves only in terms maybe a very, in a, in a very superficial way, or we, we don't appreciate the significance of our, of our own conscious experience. But in meditation, we're actually learning from things that are, that are very ordinary, from the ordinary experience of life, that is not extreme, not uh, unique in its sense that it's it's that that uh, you have to struggle to get it, but people that can feel that that can relax and let go of the world, they, one can one can understand the the idea of it. But to actually be able to apply that, to be able to relate to life in that way. When we've all been kind of conditioned and and, and programmed to uh, to strive and struggle, to distract ourselves, to to always think we've got to do something, we've got to prove something, we've got to get something we don't have, we've got to get rid of all kinds of bad habits and tendencies that we have that we shouldn't. This 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 kind of feeling you can contemplate that very feeling. I've done that a lot. I contemplated this sense of I've got to do something. Because that is something that, that that seemed to be very powerful and was always making my life as a as a monk, as a lay person and as a monk, something that was always taking me to some kind of sense of despair. This this sense of I've got to do it, I've got to meditate. I've got to I've got to attain something and then then you'd have certain immature emotional reactions or you get angry or or you feel lust or you'd feel uncertain or or anxious or frightened by something then you then you think oh I've got to get rid of this these bad things and we talk even the way we talk even in the buddhist world we talk about getting rid of the of the obstructions uh, oftentimes they call about killing your kilesas. Kilesas are a poly word for defilements. Uh, some of the times you have it as heavy talk, killing your, your defilements, killing your kilesas. And uh, then the mind would go, I've got to kill these kilesas. And you almost end up killing yourself. <laughs> Because that's very much how we we tend to, uh, you know, the it's easy for us too, to uh, think, and to uh, to to te- to see even meditation as as another challenge to me personally. To to me as a person, I've got to, you know, I'm I'm a person with a lot of faults. I've got to do something about this in order to become this enlightened person that the at the end of my life, or maybe in the next one. But notice in, in the contemplation of a Nietzsche or change, impermanence, we're, 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 not, we're not looking, we, don't, we aren't saying looking at the whole span of life in terms of uh, we have to do this, I mean, it's, it, we do it, we learn how to contemplate our lives as it, as it changes and we get old. But the but the but the, the the insights come through very small things like this scene, the uh, despair and and being able to to 
contemplate despair, anguish, grief, these kind of negative mental states, or anger, or or uh, uncertainty, anxiety, kind of nebulous, amorphous feelings, uh, negative feelings that hang around us. We can contemplate them, meaning we we acknowledge them, we begin to accept them for what they are and 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 observe them, be with them, sustain our attention on them. And what happens then? When we learn to do that more and more, then that, that takes patience. We have to we need to develop that sense of willingness and, and being patient and Patience means that we're not, we learn from our failures and we have to keep off going back to square one and start again. But we, but we develop patience. And then we have the insight into the end of suffering. That despair, when, we, when, when it's fully understood, when we accept it, and that is, is impermanent. It ceases, and when it's and then when we let it go, and it ceases, then there's this sense of relief. You feel this, this sense of, oh, this is nice. <laughs> it's not like a high, but it's the sense of relief. And so we note that sense of relief, and in that, and I, and this is my own reflections on, on relief, is that. It's very peaceful, and there's no, and the, and in that state, there's no sense of yourself as being somebody or having to become, having to prove, having to change, having to get rid of things, having to do anything. Nor is there a feeling that you don't have to do anything because I don't have to do anything is another is is just the same problem. But it's it's uh, where you have. Let go of a condition that is that has that before you've never let go of. You've only mm, mm, distracted yourself from it, or, or repressed it in some way. And therefore, it, you've never known the relief from it. You've only, you only, or you only know how to just, just kind of, when this happens, you go like this and run away from it, and distract yourself, look in the other direction. But with it, with meditation, with this contemplative meditation, then you 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 actually recognize the whole cycle. This is the way it is, and the the relief from grasping is like this. It's just this much. It's not anything you can describe in detail. But but when you when you are when you have that sense of relief, no, contemplate that. Begin to to notice it more, rather than just uh, dismiss it, because it might not be of great significance to the universe at this moment. But it is something to contemplate. And in your own, say, practice of meditation, more and more you you begin to to get the feeling for it of how, t- when we, because just the idea of having to meditate often creates tension. It's interesting in monastic life how uh, you you just the idea of discipline. Say in 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 monasteries you've got discipline. The idea of discipline can create this uh, that that how that affects the mind of many uh, men and women. You got to keep the rules. Now what is that? I mean, just saying something like that. If you become a monk, you've got to keep 227 rules. That's why you wonder anyone would become a monk. <laughs> but those are, those are like when we talk like that, it's just say the idea of rules and, and uh, discipline uh, means that I've got, to, I've, got to, I've got to do this. I've got to keep all these rules. I've got to purify myself by keeping all these rules uh, and uh, maybe I won't be able to and and then the whole sense of oneself is is uh, arises with with an emotional reaction this idea of discipline rules 
that are imposed on you. You've got to keep these rules. So I contemplate, I used to contemplate, is this what the Buddha actually intended his, uh, his monastic system to be? You know, is this, is this, uh, because this is oftentimes how it sounds to us. Uh, you know, how we tend to, uh, like, my, my cultural background being American is, uh, is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a cultural background based on, on, on freedom, individual freedom, rights rights to, to be able to do what you want and be happy and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and and no hierarchical structures we're all equal president clinton queen elizabeth me we're all the same So then, this this uh, so there's a certain cultural pattern there that influences, and so, but you can contemplate this and say. So then I began to to see if the Buddha was, is 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 his, if it's a wisdom teaching, and he's teaching us the way to to non-suffering, to ultimate realization, then maybe how I interpret words like discipline, rules, and all that. Maybe he didn't mean it the way I'm picking it up, the way I tend to react to those words. So then you contemplate, how can I apply this, these, these, these rules and this discipline so that it's not just an oppressive system that, that's reinforcing my ego or making me f- feel op- oppressed by having to, to live within these restraints. But it's obviously to change one's attitude. I could change my attitude towards it. I could leave. I could just not bother to ordain, or leave. I could leave the monastery and get out of the whole thing uh, anyway. No, nobody come. Seem me to stay in. But maybe that's maybe I've got it wrong just by my cultural reactions, my personal reactions to things like discipline, to rules, to hierarchy. So then, this is this is where, uh, say, somebody like Ajahn Chah's genius was was uh, I think very helpful to mo- to many Western monks because uh, he presented this this very reflective teaching. And one began to see that that if the, that the actual monastic system was was organized in a way so that you want to live it, and that you want to live your whole life within this style, well then, if it's just an oppressive system of rules that that you've got to keep and you're frightened of breaking them and all that, then it it becomes unbearable. You don't want to stay a monk very long if that's how you that's how you're living the life. You can you can only do that, operate like that for so long, and then you you don't want to do it. It's too. It's it's just uh, uh, you know something that you you can't stand. It just oppresses your mind. It makes you tense all the time. You're always worried. So then we think that we would contemplate. Well, then what? How do we live this life in which these tensions are relieved? By throwing out the rules and the discipline, that's not it. But in changing one's attitude by through reflecting and contemplating, and learning how to relax or to to no, to be relieved by the not no longer to create tensions around the conditions of the body of the of the system that one is in, and of course that is using wisdom. The mindfulness, wisdom, sati, panya are the are the kind of uh, important words in uh, the Buddhist teaching. Mindfulness is the path to the deathless. Heedlessness is the way to death. Those who are mindful, those who are heedless are always dying. 
This is from the Dhammapada. Those who are heedless, not mindful, just caught up into reacting to life heedlessly, they're, they're like forever dying. Every moment there's some kind of death. So this means that death is like that. I mean, it's just always a sense of of having to seek something new. You know, always having to be reborn again. Distracting yourself, moving from this to that. Just creature of habit. Just bound by the conditioning process. Not a free person to, not a, a joyful life, but just a creature that's just kind of learned how to react to to this stimulation and that thing. So, a heed, heedless person is someone that's like always dying. There's always this sense of dying going on. It's a discomfort, ill at ease, distracted. It's like always dying. But those who are mindful n- never die. So that that's for contemplation. Now, recognized language is uh, is all, all slightly confusing because it is a limited uh, tool. You know, you can't language only kind of points at things. It's not. It can't. It's not the realization. So, uh, and sometimes you, you have to deal with paradox and. Because the limitation of language, you can only have one word at one moment. And so, you know, it's kind of linear process. So you have, uh, you have to have the, the noun and, the, and the, the verb and the adjective and things like this, and kind of grammatical patterns that are considered uh, good, good English. But the, and so language is, uh, you know, it's a tool. It's not, not something to to uh, grasp in itself. But it's a very helpful tool to us and, it, uh, and it's something that, that the Buddha used in his teaching. He used language. And the, the Dhamma teachings, that's language. But it's a skillful use of language not for grasping but for this contemplation. So you're, you're looking, you're watching, you're learning from life. From this, from the very center of conscious experience, which is you yourself, and whatever it is that's going on, you know, whether even if you have crazy thoughts or whatever, it's it's still <laughs> it's still the, the your refuge isn't in trying to to get rid of it, but in understanding the that these that the the conditioned realm. Are, is impermanent, and to to feel the relief of of that, to recognize the relief of letting go and non-attachment. And sometimes you just feel this a sense of relief, in in like I remember I, in the mornings here, at five in the morning we meet in this hall, and we sit till six thirty. And uh, I really, uh, I'm, a, I'm a morning person. I like the mornings, and so this, this is this, this sense of uh, of the community, the monks together here meditating. It's nice to be with other people, uh, and then you you're contemplating the, the the state of mind you're in, the particular, you know, physical. Situ- uh, conditions that, that you're experiencing and, uh, and the kind of mood or, or the kind of th- thoughts that keep coming up. And you learn how to, to just accept all this and, and kind of embrace it and be with it. And then it all, it all seems to kind of, you, you, you're letting it go and that sense of relief is a, is, is a very, uh, you say, Nibbana is the highest happiness. There we go into superlatives. The Buddha said Nibbana is the highest happiness. That's a superlative. But what is the highest happiness? Not a drug trip into the Brahma realms, but the human, most ordinary kind of human experience of relief. 
So don't underestimate this, your own experience of life and think that you've, you, you have to get something that you've never had before and, you, and that, uh, that you've got to, you know, and it's really hard and very difficult and, and uh, it's so, you know, you've got to develop so many marvelous uh, things in order to get it uh, that you don't see how you can possibly do it in this lifetime. That, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the... That's the highest uh, happiness in terms of uh, of, uh, of conditioned highs. People have tried that, and there's drug culture, isn't it? That's happened in the last thirty years. It's, it's pushing human pleasure to its possible to its height, isn't it? Trying to get as much pleasure out of the sense realm, emotional realm, as you can possibly squeeze out of your human state. And it can't maintain it. You can't, you know, you can, you know, I guess I'm taking some of these drugs, you must get in pretty kind of fantastic states of bliss or happiness or something or other. Because you certainly, they certainly get addicted. That means they want to do it over and over again. But it's not sustainable, is it? You can't hold it with normal conscious experience. There is normal again. With ordinary conscious experience. So notice that meditation is around not around around uh, taking drugs and and uh, and special uh, electronic equipment that gets you into some kind of special state, but it's learning to be with just the learning to let go while sitting, standing, walking, lying down while breathing, and so it and this uh, this then the highest happiness isn't a condition of, of uh, you know, that depends on, on, on chemicals or uh, equipment or special situations, but more and more we, we realize that that's the norm, the normal way. One can say Nibbana is the norm. But not Nibbana of, of uh, that, we, that we interpret as a a far out high experience, but it's it's the it's the balance that that where the the self importance the the grasping the compulsion the obsessiveness of our minds we've let it all go for that moment and that sense of relief contemplate and notice that what it is like and we we like to go on some of these hikes remember. Uh, a year ago, I went with Ajahn Sujito and and a layman to the Pyrenees for two weeks. We hiked in the Pyrenees. After a long day's hike with sore feet and everything, and you sit down, and Nick would make a cup of tea. Nibbana. <laughs> <laughs> Relief, isn't it? Or that's a special situation, hiking in the Pyrenees for me, but in, say, in uh, daily life at Amravati, how much just learning to, to recognize that state and, and trusting in it more and more, rather than thinking in the worldly mind is conditioned to make problems. And, you know, they, you know, so and so wants to disrobe, or, you know, uh, somebody's spreading some bad rumors or this is how it happened or all these kind of things that happen in the worldly life. There's there's so many kind of uh, things to worry or feel anxious or feel indignant about in in the worldly life. In, even in monastic life, if you're going to, to make that your your refuge, then it's it's suffering to to have no relief from it. But we can bear with these vicissitudes, with these conditions uh, that are part of our human experience when we, when we know the way of non-suffering. And so this, this I want to, to offer as a contemplation uh, for you to, to consider this and to, to begin to get to know that within you 
in your within your own experience of life. It's not something alien or foreign. It's just something you haven't noticed very much. <laughs> or, <laughs> or you've never really appreciated it because you tend to see yourself as uh, somebody who who uh, whose whose experience of life maybe you don't you don't appreciate you tend to compare yourself with somebody else or see yourself only in terms of in critical ways so the no, we tend to to disparage easily disparage and put ourselves down and not recognize uh, the, the 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 kind of marvelous things that are actually happening to us that we 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 don't notice because we we we're so caught up in the conditions of our own uh, that we regard as ourself. So I th- talk now for a, over an hour. So this time for a break. So the tea will be served, uh, and in about fifteen minutes, I'll ring the bell, and we can all uh, sit down again, and we can have a discussion. So, if there are any, I will attempt to answer them, discuss them, talk around them, (laughs) refuse to answer them. So if you don't say anything, then they they assume you're guilty. Mm. I think silence is very disturbing in those kind of situations where you're trying to you want a reaction of that, you know, <laughs> and silence is something that people don't uh, appreciate unless you're contempt. Uh, is where you meet somebody and and then the, they don't quite know what to say and then there's a kind of embarrassed silence and then you try to struggle to say say anything sometimes you say some really silly thing because uh, to fill that that silence with something when in uh, in in they say in meditation you're cultivating silence uh I, I like to what I call listen to silence, and you are kind of constantly kind of trying to think everything, or or your, your mind is always so busy. It's in the silence that you can really relax, be, and with a good friend, isn't it? When you trust, then there can be silence. When you don't know somebody very well, then you then a silence. If you're, if you think, if you're trying to accuse somebody or something, then that's a good one to contemplate. Well, let's say that 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 gives you the perspective, like the it's the suffering 
that that is the key to non-suffering. I, you know, so that, that it's it's when you, it's it's like the first noble truth is the first truth of, is the truth of suffering. So it's it's pointing to 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 an, a common experience that we none of us want suffering, but it's through that tension is is. That by contemplating that the tension or stress, that you begin to uh, realize the relief of it. Where if you don't, if you don't contemplate, you don't see it or accept it, then then you tend to merely just create more stress. But even by trying to get out of it, you're creating. You're still caught up in some struggle and and suppression or repressive habits. And recognize that this this realm is a thing that, like the realm of the human realm, having a body. It is. It's a you know tension in it. Just it's a natural part of it. Having to carry burdens or having to to uh, you know just survive it means that we have to you know we have to work hard. We have to. Do all kinds of things to to survive on this planet, but uh, and so there's nothing wrong with that, or that, like we we shouldn't feel this stress or tension. But th- but if we aren't reflective, we don't contemplate, then we're merely caught up in in the in the things that take us to you know breakdowns, to to bad health, to uh, all kind of just depressions or. You know, kinds of miserable. We make make our lives miserable, but when we put it in a context of you know noticing tension and relief, and that, then then uh, then you have perspective on on tensions and stress and suffering, and how to how to interpret it rather than in a personal way. Like what is really painful in modern human beings, we we everything is. Personalized, you know. It's always me. Everything is, is you know, whatever mood or emotion, my anger, my lust, my problem. Everything is in, is is given such a. Uh, it's it's seen in such personal terms, where a lot of these things are just part of human the human experience. The suffering of life is common to us all. Uh, sexual drives, all these are common to us all. These are not personal things. Hunger for food and things like that. Because you can idolize, you know, like I've seen monks do that. They, they think, I'm a terribly greedy person because I feel hunger for food. I mean, hunger for food is, isn't, isn't personal. That's a physiological thing. <laughs> <laughs> but yet we can we can feel uh, you know that because we feel hungry for food that we're greedy. I mean we can interpret it in that way. I've seen monks in Thailand. You know, some of the Western monks used to just go on fast, you know, to try to get rid of this greed for food. Lung Po Cho used to laugh at them all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get rid of something.